Shabbat Shalom uh, to everyone, wherever you are in the world. And, uh, and if you're uh, joining us live, a very big welcome. If we haven't had a chance to say welcome to you uh, in person. Uh, and uh, for those who are joining us uh, via the video, uh, a very big welcome to you. And uh, we, uh, we encourage you and love to see you in person and come say hi to the community. If you've not said hi to the community, um, then uh, don't be shy. Come and uh, come and say hi. The uh, wonderful, wonderful group of people that are uh, learning to get over ourselves at this time as we get closer to uh, the end of the age and uh, the return of the kings. So uh, if you're led to come and join us, um, just go to the rivershabbat.com website. And uh, when you scroll down, you'll see join our newsletter. You hit that subscribe and all you do is put your email address first and last name and you'll get our weekly newsletter. And in that newsletter, uh, there's a button at the bottom of the teaching that uh, you can click and uh, that will bring you in to the live gathering, uh, which is every Shabbat at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So um, if you've not come and join us, don't be shy. Come and say hi. We'd love to see you. Okay, we are continuing our journey on conformity or unity. Who was here or has gone through the conformity or unity uh, at the start of this journey? Hands up if you've seen it. And if you haven't, I encourage you, um, you know, again, because we are sort of looking at something in these foundational teachings. And so um, uh, please... Uh, um, please go back and uh, to look at that because uh, is a part of these foundational teachings. I've been reminded that um, that uh, to go back and to uh, give some of these principles uh, to the wider community, especially as we continue to grow and people continue to look deeper. So we're uh, we're just looking at some things that can challenge us, and uh, and so uh, today is one of those uh, type of teachings where we'll just continue to be challenged and to look at this and, and, and what our journey uh, is uh, before him and with others. And so um, we want to be able to look at our, uh, to look at our faith uh, with, uh, with some honesty and the integrity uh, as it uh, sort of plays around our witness uh, and our ambassadorship um, as we search uh, matters out. So we've got this titled Ask Yourself. And what's that all about, Ducky? So we've got to ask yourself here, and I've got taker or giver. I'm going to give another quote here by uh, John F. Kennedy, um, who's uh, one of my favorite uh, presidents. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, even though some of you uh, may know um, may not uh, may not be too pleased with the behavior politically with the Democrat Party right now. He was a Democratic president, but uh, I think John F. Kennedy would struggle to recognize his own party these days. Um, but in either case, um, I appreciated a lot of the wisdom this man actually had. Um, and uh, and he, you know, to do his best in the in the political realm and the dynamics of, you know, the incredible country of the United States of America. Um, and he paid his life um, for uh, the position and the stand he would take on certain things. And so um, I want to give that respect to him because uh, he made some very famous quote here that everyone will be familiar. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And we all know the quote, or we should know um, this statement because it's very interesting. I've got here at the bottom here, ask not what the body of Messiah can do for you. Ask what you can do for the body of Messiah. And so what position do we take coming in and gathering as a community? Are we a people, are we takers, you know, or do we come as givers? And, uh, and, and, that whole position of taking and giving is not just, it's not just a financial thing or, um, you know, um, doing things for people we like or don't like, and, you know, or all these kinds of things with certain agendas. It's really a position of, do we really engage uh, with the faith in a way that um, would bring or bear a fruit met for repentance that would, that would bring an outcome uh, of true unity? And uh, true unity is actually an outcome. 
Uh, often the religious dogmas, which we talked about last week, are, are surrounded around the various forms of conformity. And conformity can be a real counterfeit to true unity. Um, however, we're going to look at some things here. Um, and, and the question uh, that I'll leave off at this part of the series um, is uh, going to continue to challenge us because um, after this, we'll be going into authority crisis. And everything we are experiencing right now in the world is relating very much to this whole conformity unity aspect. But Rome has its version, but we also have to work through these things as a community. Uh, and what we experience coming into the body. And quite often, and it's sad for me, but I see almost this, um, yeah, this secular political type behavior is constantly brings its way into our faith and into the community. And Rome, uh, it's got its own journey, but we are not to bring the behavior or the attitudes of Rome into the body. And we don't know it, but we, we get influenced uh, by what's going on out there in our daily lives. And then we bring that to our gatherings. We bring this to the Sabbath. We bring this, you know, which we'll be speaking about next week. We bring it even to the Moedims. We're not guarding those things that are his. Um, they're his appointed times. That includes the weekly Sabbath. And so, and then we have, of course, the spring and fall Moedim. And so what are we bringing to this? And so, of course, John F. Kennedy wasn't speaking from a spiritual body sense, but the actual point he was making is very relevant. You're all coming here today. And is it just as a taker? Or are you actually coming with a heart of giving? Now, you're saying, well, that's a little bit more difficult, of course, when we're, you know, um, uh, gathering online and we're scattered and we're dividing everything else. But I'm going to challenge to the, as we go through this, that statement, I believe if we were to apply to the body is purely a heart matter. And it won't matter whether you're gathering in, in, uh, in a live gathering like this, whether you're gathering physically at the Modim or on your weekly Sabbath. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind here, you know, ask not what the body of Messiah can do for you, but ask what you can do for the body of Messiah. I often challenge the discipleship environments in this way. You know, I say to the, to the men that, uh, we get together in the stables and things like that. Um, you know, sometimes you hear people make statements like, well, you know, this, you know, the stable doesn't give me this, or this doesn't give me that, or this doesn't. And it's always about what everyone is not doing for you. <laughs> but if you come to something like this live gathering into a discipleship environment to the Moedim, I wonder what it would look like if we had millions of us on the face of the earth that came with, well, what can I do? What can I give? What can I be as a part of this gathering? Or is it always just about what everybody is not doing for me? Woe is me. I'm not happy with this teaching. Oh, I'm not happy with this gathering. Oh, they don't do this. Why are they not doing it this way? And we hear this over and over and over and over again. And we're expecting somehow good fruit to come from this. How does good fruit truly come from that witness and that attitude on any matter? And so as John F. Kennedy was giving that to a country to think about, I think that it's a good thing for us in the body of Messiah, because I believe our Messiah witnessed for uh, his time ministering in the flesh uh, almost 2000 years ago. He was literally demonstrating and teaching them that you're going to need to be a servant. And a servant is not a taker. A servant is a giver. And so we give of ourselves, our understanding, our knowledge, our resources, you know, whatever it may be. Well, if you had a whole nation doing that, that is an incredible thing. Who here would wish the United States of America would adopt that attitude right now? Yeah. How about Canada? How about Australia? How about New Zealand? How about South Africa? In fact, how about Europe? How about the UK? How about Russia? about everything that we're seeing going on right now. What if we really, as a people, did this? But you know what that means in order to do that? We have to get over ourselves. 
We looked last week at this destabilization of society. So as we face this, are we going to come to give or are we just going to take? We're facing this destabilization in the pillars of society that allow a society to be functional. And that's generally your medical systems, your education systems, legal systems, media, news and media, the political systems, and of course, the religious systems that govern a functioning, healthy society. If you strip away the trust in all of these major pillars, what do you have left? And right now we have a whole world right around the world that's being destabilized where people now are losing trust in all of the things that allow us to remain functional. This is very serious, of course. So where do you think this is headed? If you have a totalitarian atheist society, the only place this can go is chaos. There is actually nowhere else it can go because their belief or faith structure is actually in the state or the society that governs them. Now, we are a part of the kingdom from heaven. We talked about this last week. We are in a different position. We are watching this happen in our eyes. We have we are looking at this destabilization uh, of the global order from a faith perspective. But what if you didn't have that? What if your faith was in the very thing that's being destabilized? And so we talked about that. And of course, the example I used was environmentalism, one of the most dangerous religions on the face of the earth right now, in my opinion, this cult of death, uh, this environmental movement and uh, this these things around climate change. You know, it's like every decade there's something new. You know, I know growing up over the years, you know, we were all going to freeze to death in 10 years. We're all dead because we're all going to be frozen. And then it was, you know, well, we're all going to be, you know, the ozone layer is going to kill us. And in 10 years from now, we're all going to. And as you keep seeing this fear mongering, these prophets of doom within that secular environment, they they continue to change laws to tax the people even more to take away hope and ultimately freedom. Because essentially they're trying to save their God. And that's sad. You worship something you need to save. Think about that. Well, if you take the nurturing instinct, particularly in the woman's design, and you've got to save your God, that's a very easily manipulated position now in society. Because they and the nurturing design, particularly in the woman's design, will seek to save that child or that God or that religion. And so this is where you can start to get, and we're seeing this huge divide and division starting to be pushed into this totalitarian uh, um, you know, um, situation within atheistic Rome. And it's, it's actually... Um, dividing people. It's actually separating families, spouses, you know, um, systems. And, th and we're seeing this come in as they manipulate and as they indoctrinate people into going, well, we've got to do something to save our God. And so we get these misguided lies that somehow there's a thermostat on the earth. And as long as we do this, we can turn it down and we'll save our God. We'll save Mother Earth if we if we just play with this thermostat. Now, what happens when you get into that, of course, is that the science and the state that's all around this, they only allow you the data that they want you to hear and see. So, of course, if you're playing on the nature, you're playing on fear um, and all these sorts of things, you can be indoctrinated or conditioned to agree to almost anything. How serious can this get? Well, it can get as serious as if, especially when fear turns to hate. And the loss of freedoms and livelihoods come into it. You can actually put into a society indoctrinated acceptance of genocide. We've actually seen examples of this in our human history. One of the most recent, of course, that we're familiar with was what happened in Nazi Germany. Where normal police officer one day is doing their job and journey. And 10 years later, they're taking a pregnant woman out the back and shooting her in the head. And thinking that somehow this is actually good and is required. How do you take that family man just doing their job as a police officer to that action. And if they could have seen themselves 10 years in the future, they wouldn't have known what they were looking at. By the time it arrived at the time that they would actually do it, oh, believe me, it was for the greater good. 
And right now we're seeing this argument on this slaughtering towards the unborn. Soon it becomes a non-conforming. As you learn, and as people are indoctrinated under their, uh, under this religious movement, that human beings are the problem. And anything that's a problem, of course, we've got to eradicate, right? And so could you actually educate a whole generation to actually think, well, this needs to be done for the greater good because I'm going to lose my God if we don't. And you will, it is actually horrifying to look at some of the interviews with the younger people that have now been in the modern education system, especially in the last 10 years. And you talk to these teenagers and they actually will accept statements of genocide in order to do something for the great good. You actually can't believe what you're hearing. And yet it's very real. Now, none of this, when I say, you know, this religion of environmentalism, this is not going against proper and true conservation. Overseeing and protecting the environment is our duty. And under scripture, we should be respecting and preserving and protecting and overseeing the environment, not worshiping it. Worship of the creation is simply foolishness. It is utter foolishness that can lead to very evil places. But if we worship the creator and not the creation, then we now have responsibility, accountability, and consequence to oversee it responsibly. And so one extreme does not denote that the solution is the other extreme. And this is exactly what we're seeing. But our creator has said, worship me. And protect what I have given you. Oversee what I've given you. Do these sorts of things. But of course, either extreme part of this will not. There is no river perspective going on in secular society. We are just seeing the pendulum go from one end to the other. Both are going to have the fruit of it. Both of it is going to end in death. That's why I call it cult of death. I'm just highlighting the environmentalism. Believe me, I can pick on the whole secular capitalist side too. We're not doing that today, but I'm using this example. So you see people like this young girl, this uh, Greta Gutenberg, who was used as a poster child. This little girl doesn't have any concept of responsibility, accountability, and consequence. The raising of a family, wisdom, understanding that she's actually being indoctrinated and used to put forth an agenda. She truly believes that if she doesn't do what she's doing, her God's going to die. So we don't make her the one that's the problem. The one is the problem is a society that would use a child, which it has in the last five years, manipulate that child to manipulate other children into doing this. And it's wicked and it's evil. So the face of what we see going on out there, we can tend as people to blame the faces. Well, we do this with politics too, don't we? And then it's taken into the family or it's taken into ministry and everything else. Well, it's always if I can point the finger at someone else. We've got to get out of this, not be trapped in it. We need to have our creator's perspective on all these things. So life is, uh, Rome is on life support right now in front of our very eyes. We are hanging on the last vestiges of a society that is going into collapse. Our Western society is going to collapse. And as Hasatan weaves the three main power structures, superpower structures of the earth, you've got China, you've got Russia, and you've got the global new world order. And the three of them are not agreeing on things. Now, Hasatan doesn't want them to. He's going to weave them to come against each other. The ultimate chaos. Because somebody plans on presenting himself as a hero. But what the God of this world is doing, he's going to pull the stability plug first. So that men's hearts will fail them for what's coming upon the earth. I mean, only a God is going to be able to bring solution to this. We're going to be getting into this after Sukkot in something called the Messiah deception. But right now, we are under... This whole scenario, as we're watching it play on the news, we're watching our uh, our world global order structure is essentially now on life support. And this is going to require something to step in. Okay. 
So the way God describes us, and last week we, we went through these things and we said, well, children, sheep, donkeys, and wolves is generally the animal shadow pictures that we'll find throughout scripture on how our behavior in the fallen state is described. Now, the first three of these, okay, yes, children can be imagined disobedient. Sheep can be fearful and scattery, uh, uh, scatty, and donkeys can be stubborn and noisy. Um, however, they can all give as well. Children can be, give us some of the most beautiful gifts we can see. You know, the lambs, they can give us the clothes on our back, and the donkeys can carry the burdens for us. The interesting one in the natural environment is the wolf. The wolf just takes. It never comes. The wolf does not live a world. Now, I'm not picking on dogs here and canines and whatnot. I know we've taken wolves and made them wonderful little pets. Well, you know, uh, I love dogs. But in the true natural order, in the true biblical analogy, a wolf never shows up saying, what can I do for you? <laughs> okay. We just, we need to be honest with why the father is, is taking the creation and using this example. A wolf just takes it never gives and so what we're warned about scripturally are wolves those who will just come to take and that's what they're doing and so they're used as a culling mechanism in the father's design in the fallen state to keep things under control but that's not their form of giving that's their function So they do have a place in the order, but their place is only from a taker position. I hope that's very clear for people to understand. So we looked at that. And then, of course, that led to the fig leaves, you know, uh, and I went back to better sheet in Genesis uh, 3, 7, 8. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew the yada or yada to know, to perceive, to discern. OK, so they literally were able to understand something has gone down. The consequence of their choice has come into being. And as a result of that, they knew that they were naked. So the shame of that naked was being felt. So their immediate reaction in a fallen state now was to sow fig leaves, to cover up, to hide. So they sewed the fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now, it's very interesting what they sought to cover up because we're going to see a reversal of this in the New Testament of the Brit Hadashah. They heard the sound of Yah Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So there's a direct interaction here with the king. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of their creator. You mean that this got so bad that they were seeking to hide themselves from God? not actually go into repentance, not to turn in this state. We're going to hide ourselves and we're going to do this among the rest of the trees. Well, it's very interesting. The root word there, the hagor is to girdle the belt. They're actually making out of their fig leaves. Well, we see the reversal of the garden coming up here in the apostle Paul when he in Ephesians 6, 11, 12, he says, put on the whole armor of Elohim that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So he's, he's saying literally, okay, this happened to Adam and Eve. Notice what's going on. The, you know, the, the adversary comes in. There's a great deception that's gone down. Their way of dealing with that reception is putting on some fig leaves to cover their shame and hiding from their creator. All right, Paul's going to reverse this in the statement of these great, uh, this great statement of the armor, you know, we think of it as the armor of God. But there's a true order here regarding spiritual battle. And he says here, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. He's directly relating this to the spiritual enemy. Against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. The equivalent in the Hebrew there from the Greek is Ra. Interesting. So this is definitely spiritual. It's definitely deception from the adversary. And does it link directly back to the original fall of the creation? Absolutely, it does. Therefore, take up the whole armor of Elohim that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. This is not go and attack. It doesn't say to be able to go out and attack and throw your agenda on everyone's faces and you're, you're the savior of the body of Messiah. 
It's saying that you are the target of deception and to stand firm. And how are you going to do that? The very priority that he gives. Therefore, having fastened the belt of truth. Instead of your fig leaves and hiding and turning away from Elohim, I want you to put on his truth in place of your nakedness and your shame. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, his righteousness, which covers your heart, which is what this is all about. Heart circumcision. This is the very order of priority. This great apostle given and designated by Yah from an incredible position of repentance to bring forth and make no mistake about it. He goes right back to the garden here. He's going to reverse this. Instead of your fig leaves, I want you to put on my truth. Wow. Okay. And then I want you to guard your heart with my righteousness, which is going to, if we can bring in the, the, and not deny the power of the Ruach, it's actually going to end up in heart circumcision. So this is interesting. So then we used the example last week, of course, of Yaakov and uh, who would bring about and identify uh, in scripturally the people of Israel. And they would come out of slavery, which we've all been in your whole life. By the way, none of you are free. You know, you're under the God of this world. <laughs> Every time I hear people scream, you know, I'm fighting for freedom. I'm doing all that. I'm thinking, really? You do realize you've been in bondage your whole life. And they're like, oh. And some of you now have made it here today because all of a sudden something called the covenant, which is given to us in the Torah, came into your understanding. Now, that can also lead to understanding the blood that covers us in order that you may even have a chance to do that. Unfortunately, you know, in our brothers in modern Judaism, they don't understand that yet. So they're flying partly blind. And in Christianity, they don't understand that the very thing that they're being brought into is his righteousness. And so they're flying partly blind. But what Teshuvah can do by not hiding, by turning in this place of nakedness and shame, we can start to drop the fig leaves. We can start to have an honest walk. But we have something called Mystery Babylon that is trying to sow fig leaves at a breakneck speed and whatever religious dogma you're going to involve yourself in. And you don't know it because most of you wouldn't do this. You're not knowingly sowing fig leaves, but that's what you've been doing for a lot of your journey so far. And the Ruach is going, look, I need, I need you to listen to Paul here, the Apostle Paul. We need to get rid of these fig leaves. So what's going on here? So this unity and conformity, true unity is not conformity. It is an outcome. It is a fruit of something. Well, then conformity is bad. No, we're not saying that. What we're saying is, is conformity doesn't necessarily bring about true unity. So now the issue is going to come into, you know, what is your conformity? Which is the best conformity you can be formed by? <laughs> and, and, and so we're, we're grappling with this now, playing on both sides of this river. Well, is it all, the, the, you know, modern Judaism's got it all right. All the 30,000 plus flavors of Christianity, they've all got it right, really. And all these factions and divisions and fig leaves. I mean, we're fig leaf manufacturers in religious dogma. I mean, we've got factories pumping out fig leaves. And we just wrap it up. Most of the time, because we're deceived, we'll talk about that. This is not about our feelings. Remember, I said today that unfortunately, we're dealing with some matters on our foundational teachings, which tend to tend to stir us. This is not an attack on anyone, anyone listening on the video, anybody here in the live gathering. No one's attacking you. And certainly the one who's presenting this is not coming from a position of righteousness. I've had to live all this understanding, too. I've had to deal with my fig leaves. I've had to go through the crushings and the fires of my life that I could see or hear anything. There is no self-righteousness going on here. If we want his righteousness, we've got to get our self-righteousness out of the equation. But I do know one thing. True authority, when we get into authority crisis, will come from the overcoming position. And we are overcoming our fallen state, interacting with our sovereign, with our creator. But those who go through their trials and tribulation and overcome will speak with an authority of the Ruach, of the Holy Spirit, 
of our creator. And that authority does not come in a classroom because you learned a little bit of Hebrew or Greek or some interesting study. True authority is going to come with overcoming. And of course, this is mentioned to those who will be selected for the bride of Messiah, to those who overcome. He doesn't say to those who I love and the rest I'm going to torture in some Dante's Inferno forever. He's saying to those who overcome, I will grant. There's something here in these, these things that is pointing to this overcoming reality. You should never have to demand authority. If it's true authority. Not to someone else who's in teshuva. The only time people have authority issues is when they're not in repentance themselves. And the person that's demanding the authority isn't in repentance. Well, we've got two parties here not in repentance. How's that going to look? So the teachers, the prophets, the rabbis, the pastors, whatever, they're not in repentance. And now everybody's showing up, listening to whatever it is they're saying. They're not in repentance. Well, we wonder why it looks like a mess. Nobody's coming to the party as the giver. Everybody is taking. If we're not in a place of teshuva or metanoia in the Greek, or repentance in the English. This is not about unity at all costs. No way. His unity is an outcome. Our pursuit is Messiah. And again, this is where I often make these statements. People say, well, I, you know, I found Torah three years ago. No, you didn't find Torah. It was never lost. Well, I found Jesus on the Christian side. No, you didn't. Find the, you know, Messiah was never lost. So whatever your understanding of these things are, they haven't gone anywhere. You didn't find anything. He called you. And maybe just something in your life, be it a fire, a trial, um, a sovereign choice to turn to him, has allowed you to get to the point where you, you may even be hearing a message like this. Okay. So we have had the luxury to behave badly, a lot of us, many of us, um, you know, and again, I'm generalizing here. So, you know, I have to, we're talking about something pretty big here. It's called the body of Messiah. So, you know, there's certain things that, uh, you know, apply and are applied to different people at different times. But all of this has come from our perspective where we know that, that our creator has got us to this place, but we've had these lives of hurt, unforgiveness, bitterness. We've lost trust in systems, in parents, even in friends and all of this. And so we're bringing all of this stuff to the party and we're hurt. We're hurting as people. And then suddenly, well, if I can just grab some fig leaves, I don't have to deal with my hurt. I can just grab the fig leaves and I can still participate in the faith. Well, what could that look like? Is it possible that we can start lobbying off ears and all this kind of things? Is it possible that we could take our fig leaves and use that as a form of self-righteousness instead of his righteousness? Let me suggest to you that persecution in our lives is the ultimate litmus test in all of this. If we're going to truly walk in his truth, we're going to experience being persecuted. And the early Kahal knew this. In 2 Timothy 3, 12 to 4, it's recorded and says this. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life. In other words, pursue his righteousness. Not all those who are perfect and you know, don't make any mistakes in the flesh. Doesn't say that. Those who are willing to live a life pursuing Elohim's life. In Messiah, in other words, under his blood. The whole way to pursue the righteousness of Elohim has been paved in his blood. We are not to take that lightly, but in our religious figlies, we often will. It says here, you will be persecuted as a result of doing this. Not you might. You will. And whether that persecution is from a son, a daughter, a family member, the Roman system, the one that's always left out, how about the religious? 
Do you know the guiltiest thing I have seen in the walk of the faith for persecu those persecuting others has come from mystery Babylon, has come from the religious dogma, has come from the so-called faith side. The most persecution I've ever experienced in my life was not secular Rome. It was actually other believers. Well, evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse. Look at this, deceiving and being deceived. So they can be doing this unknowingly. But as for you, so right now he's wrapping up this whole secular Rome, the whole mystery Babylon side of things. You got nowhere to go. Evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse. That's going to happen in this time domain. Deceiving and being deceived. Be that religious, be it secular. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed knowing from whom you have learned it. How did you get here? How did you really get here? How did this happen? We're all here trying to now help each other be in a place of repentance, seeking out a matter to see where these be so, trying to understand the faith at a deeper level. And I'd be very surprised if anybody here gathering live does not experience some form of persecution as a result of doing that, be it secular or be it religious. Yeah, I can see a lot of you nodding. <laughs> Yeah. This is going to be the litmus test of your faith. The barometer, the understanding. Where is your faith? Is it waving to and fro? Are you able to stand firm? Are you being swayed by every wind of doctrine? What's going on? Yeshua, knowing this whole environment and what would befall the early Kahal, gave a pattern in discipleship based around these three principles, questions, repetition, and parables. In prayer to go to the father so he's using these very principles as to how to deal with one another one of the greatest ways to walk with another believer in matters concerning the faith is to allow them to ask questions and for you to ask questions it develops critical thought but we also want to bring in the parables of trying to understand those truths and also the repetition of being reminded of his truth this is why I like one of the traditions that has come out of Judea, uh, modern Judaism um, with the Torah portions. There's nothing wrong with revisiting this. But if we do this with fig leaves and not with a, a heart of teshuva, then we are simply doing something. It may not be doing heart circumcision. And in some cases can even be doing us damage if it's just a knowledge pursuit. Okay, this is a scripture in 2 Corinthians 10, 3, 6. This is a very misunderstood scripture um, because a lot of the English is very poorly translated. I'm not sure I've read even one good translation of this area of Corinthians, no matter what it is, whether it be the, it just doesn't matter what English translation you have. And yes, there's some, you know, English translations out there, I believe that are better than others in certain ways and these sorts of things, but we're not to uphold our various English translations of a language that's barely 500 years old and somehow elevate that above his truth. Man, I've seen some silliness on that front. You know, why well, use this? I do that. I was like, well, I'm sorry. I know of no English version that does not struggle with certain aspects of scripture. Just some struggle here, others there. Some have taken that out, added that in, whatever. We use 10 words to describe in the Hebrew what it might take five or six words to do. We're, we're literally, you know, in this space. And so it brings a challenge to our walk. But I'm going to say this, this, this submission in fullness is a very interesting challenge with what we're seeing here and in the writings from the great apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, 3, 6, because this is often taken out of context. For we walk in the flesh. So you're in the fallen state in the time domain. You're in the test. We are not waging war according to the flesh. You're just being affected by it. He's saying here, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. Ooh. Again, remember we spoke about with the belt of truth, this girdle, this reversal of the garden. Think about this. But have divine power to destroy strongholds. 
We're getting into the nature of true spiritual warfare here, and it ain't hocus pocus Harry Potter, where if you just scream at something loud enough in the name of Jesus, suddenly everything will go away. These are the real principles based on Teshuva. Not Harry Potter spirituality, true warfare that is based in repentance. Now, look at this. We destroy, and he's going to identify how this warfare comes in. This is very interesting. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion. The hoopsma. This is interesting here in the Greek. The lofty opinion. Look at this. Thing elevated height, elevated structure barrier to lift up high. Wait a minute. Could this be referring to the faith? Do you mean that spiritual warfare in its essence is in the house? Wait a minute. What's going on here? We could have deceiving and being deceived occurring in the father's house. You mean there could be vessels for honor and dishonor happening within of this great house? It's what the scripture tells you. He's not identifying. He's not playing with atheists when he says, when he's talking this. Paul's addressing a, the, the Cahal at Corinth, who is all over the place with their behavior. All over the place. He's addressing something here. Part of this behavior he's addressing, he's likened it to the weapons of warfare. Raised against the knowledge of Elohim. What? What's going on here? So this is happening within believers concerning the knowledge of Elohim. Take every thought captive to obey Messiah. So as you're working out your matter, searching out a matter, there's an aspect of warfare occurring in your actual faith journey from those deceiving and being deceived. Now look at this. Being ready to, in the English here, very poor translation, punish every disobedience. Well, you would think that that's just, you know, a wonderful way to get people to conform. Or maybe we can self-righteously use these scriptures out of context and go attack our unbelieving family. I mean, they, the English is very ambiguous here. But the word there, punish, the, uh, um, the uh, edit KO, to vindicate one's right, to do one justice, to protect, defend. What? What's going on? An aspect of the word, the edikeo, can mean punish, but its first usage is actually not that. What an interesting English translation, isn't it? What's going on here? Every disobedience. The parakeo. Look at this. Hearing is its first usage. Hearing amiss or not hearing. You know, the word talks about those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. Now think about this in the context of the spiritual warfare, the arguments that are coming in from people deceiving and being deceiving. They have lofty opinions or in its hoopsama, the elevated opinions that they're going to bring into this. There seems to be as a part of being able to have divine power to destroy the strongholds of these actions, which is the true antecedent of the scripture, is to be ready to do one justice and to protect and to defend when they can't hear until you come into the obedience is complete or the submission is in fullness. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is that a stick on one another? Or is that you show up at the party to give? Do you see how misleading? I tell you, I've seen this scripture used out of context like you wouldn't believe. The onus is that you're going to be in this place of warfare as a result of mystery Babylon and the divine power to destroy strongholds from the lofty opinions and structures, which are actually coming against the true knowledge of Elohim is to take your thoughts captive and get ready to protect 
to do justice, to defend those who are hard of hearing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's a different attitude. If we brought that into the true spiritual warfare in the body as our gift from Mystery Babylon, this whore of Babylon, if we brought that to the party, would we actually see 30,000 plus divisions? Would we really see all the factions in Judaism? Would we really see all the hurt, mistrust, and damage that is being done by people who believe to other believers? Hmm. What is our character and witness? If we can't do it with each other, how the heck are we going to do this with Rome? Oh, well, those pagan sinners just need to listen to Elohim Curtis. Because Elohim Curtis is the righteousness by which all will be judged. Does that sound right to anyone? Oh, we've got so-called leaders in the body doing just that. Finding Truth. Anybody familiar? Remember this movie? A few good men. Love the title of that movie. A few, a few good men. You know, it actually says the workers in the end of all of the end of the age, right? The harvest is great and the workers are few. Look at this. I want the truth. You can handle the truth. That's what a courtroom in Rome looks like over a military case that the movie was based on. And I still think that looks a lot better than a lot of the behavior I see in the body. What is that witness? Who do we look more like? Do we look like the words of, does that look like the words of the apostle Paul to you? Does it? Do you think that's how you even got here with your faith is because that's how the early Kahal learned to walk their faith up. You stand on the true faith. And now we all enjoy that those people actually entered into Teshuva, got over themselves. And we are here today with a faith. And I see now people with this so-called faith acting like this. So we're acting the very way that didn't get us here. And now I'm using a Roman Hollywood movie to demonstrate that we're actually worse than they are a lot of the time. This is unbelievable. I'm using them in the parable. Yeshua also did that. At least amongst the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribe of the religious system at the time. Interesting, isn't it? I'm finding myself doing the same thing my king did almost 2,000 years ago. How did that happen? I'm right. You're wrong. It goes on in 2 Timothy to say this, and we're reading from verses uh, chapter 2, 24, 26. And your servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. Equivalent of that is raw. They're at the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. They're eating from the evil side. And the leaven in the house, it's very hard to hear. Correcting his opponents with gentleness. Yah may perhaps grant them to shoot as a result. You mean we're in spiritual warfare here? And a part of spiritual warfare is actually not yelling at someone? Hmm. Wonder if that's what we're seeing out there. Leading to the knowledge of truth. Interesting. Hold on to that statement, the knowledge of truth. This intimate knowledge is what's being implied there in the Greek. And they may come to their senses <laughs> and escape from the snare of the adversary after being captured by him to do his will. Whoa, 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 whoa. You mean this deceiving is happening in a believing sense and they're doing the work of the adversary. And it's actually being likened into the spiritual warfare realm. Hmm. 
Is anybody finding this a little bit interesting? That maybe their understanding of spiritual warfare might have been a bit deeper and a bit more than what perhaps many of us have been taught? And this could all affect the true unity of Messiah as a body. These seven steps to biblical context, if you know my teachings, I reiterate this from time to time. I have people come to me, I want to know the truth. You can't handle the truth and all this. And, and you simply sit them both down. And, you know, I'm watching these things happen. I said, okay, so you're both trying to get to the matter of truth here. All right, well, let's look at the truth. Who said it? Well, they can't even answer that. I don't know, but it's in this verse. Well, when was it even said? When was this even written? Well, it doesn't matter. Well, then where was it said? What's the context of this? Well, I don't know. What was said? Well, that doesn't matter either. You know the gist. Who was it said to? For what reason? Why was it said at all? And how does this line up with the whole counsel in the word of Yah? Do you know these seven basic steps are almost never done before you see the behavior? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. So I've now got two sisters or two brothers or a brother and a sister, and they're all yabbering at each other and something warned about by Paul. And they can't even answer these. The actual biblical context is so far removed. But that's okay. Because I'm the righteous one for which everyone is judged by. And my understanding of the truth right now is what the judgment that my brother and sister will face. Because I'm on the throne. Anybody offended yet? Please understand, as we look at even the full context of all of these things. I'll speak a little bit about here today. I should have included um, even the calendar issues on this. Do you know that as we work out our faith, there are some things that are above our pay grade? Do you know the division that I see on the, you know, God, the father, God, the son, the name of God, flat earth, calendar. Unbelievable. We're going to get into this in the Messiah deception, God, the father, God, the son. You'll have a Q&A available to you after this. I'd like somebody on this screen to come and tell me who creator Elohim is. And who gave you that image if you think you do know? You know, this is what Israel struggled with, always making him in their own image. And Catholicism made him a big old guy with a white beard sitting in the clouds. Islam's made the same similar version, although he's very capricious. Judaism has got all sorts of versions of God the Father because they remotely will never accept the Messiah. Who here thinks you have the capacity to understand who creator Elohim is? And whatever image you've got going on in your mind, you're wrong. Oh, but we're going to divide the body over this. Unless they conform, we all divide all by pride on something that's above your pay grade. I'm not saying it's not an honorable pursuit to understand how Elohim interacts with his creation. Indeed, he wants us to. But you don't get to make it up. You get to go on the journey of trying to search your matter out. And Paul's telling you, you're going to do it a certain way. And if you don't do it this way, you're going to be used by the enemy. I wonder if we've seen any fruit of that. What are you telling me, donkey? I'm just using a few things here to make a point. What are you telling me, donkey? That I don't know who God is? Well, creator Elohim, no, you actually don't. You don't even have the capacity to understand that. We can comprehend Yeshua. 
because we're in that state and he didn't cheat. He comes in that state. Now we can start to get and understand the father. No one shall come unto the father, but through me. Do you think he was lying? We're instructed not to make Elohim in our own image, but we still think we can. And now we got all this stuff coming in the body. Hmm. Wonder what's going on. We get all these weird doctrines from modalism to, you know, various um, things that are going on in the Trinity doctrines, everything. And it's just like, it's all above your pay grade. You get to search out what you have in his word with each other in a place of repentance, having the, the, the spirit of something you can't understand interact in your life to lead you unto all truth. Or you've got your image of God that can lead you on on truth. By the way, I'll let you know who your true image of Elohim is. If you've tried to make him up in your own mind, go look in the mirror. There's your God. Anybody offended yet? Isn't this brutal? And by the way, I've had to say this all to me long before any of you. Okay. Do you know what it was like waking up one day and realizing what God looked like? And I'm looking in the mirror and I'm going, well, if that's God, then we're in trouble here, people. I better get on my knees. Thank goodness it wasn't. But I sure as heck was acting like it. Do you know what, that's what he's doing? He's, he's taking us to a place to go, son, daughter, stop it. This is above your pay grade. Stop it. But we hoisted upon each other in this quarrelsome, dividing way. Ephesians 5, 6 puts it like this. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of Elohim comes upon the sons of disobedience. There's an allusion there to the, the, uh, the fall modin. The wrath of Elohim comes upon the sons of disobedience. The piathotic. Obstinance. Obstinate. Opposition to the divine will, transgression. Do you mean these are people that are in an obstinate place? That are trying to deceive us? Oh, you conform. You take my understanding of the Godhead or you get out of here. You're not worthy for this journey. It's my blood that bought you. They don't say that, but they might as well. going on here how did we get involved with all this stuff exactly like scripture told us what it comes in this is why paul said wear the belt of truth <laughs> yeshua first words out of his mouth repent none of this is a surprise and nothing new under the sun but suddenly these words and these verses and these things we've heard over the years suddenly they're not just cliche or flippant anymore are they we start to dig a little bit deeper, we realize that the early Kahal was dealing with very serious matters on something that was going to try and attack the truth and righteousness of our creator. And here we are almost 2,000 years later in the West, and we're a little bit of a mess. <laughs> and maybe we want to revisit the principles the early Kahal had to deal with in order that we may bear or start to bear fruit met for repentance. All of us. Who is trying to deceive you? 1 John 2, 25, 26 says this. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you that those who are trying to deceive you from what? Eternal life. This is direct reference to Yeshua Messiah. If you ever want to spot the adversary, I promise you, it will attack the blood of Messiah. It will attack a fire. It will attack the sacrifice, the lamb. It, just dig deep enough and you'll start to see, wait a minute, this is going after Messiah. This mystery Babylon, these occult influences that we see in modern Judaism and Christianity, man-made traditions, lies and confusion that comes out of it. 
creating the scattering and the division because people have more of a fear of man once they get involved in conformity and not Elohim. As I always say, both hold great truths, but both are infected by Mystery Babylon. Come out of her, my people. Because if you don't, the fourth of the matter of the covenant, the ambassadorship is going to be at stake here. Or the third. Thou shalt not take his name in vain. That doesn't mean using his word as a, his name as a swear word or something. <laughs> This is literally our ambassadorship. The witness, our witness. This warning of a great delusion. Christianity has not suffered from last day's apostasy as they try and said. They're all trying to wonder what's going on right now. It was birthed from it. It's always been infected in the denomination and movements after movement after movement. The instruction wasn't from Yah, become a good Christian. It was repent and come out of her. I'm not picking on my Christian brothers and sisters here, but we need to understand this because you see a whole bunch of things. Oh, well, you know, Christianity is suffering from a, no. The leaven in the house is coming and being exposed as we come to the end of the age. Absolutely. But our brothers in Judah. Ancient Judaism has not suffered from being forgotten. Modern Judaism has been corrupted from within. It doesn't mean the great truths aren't there that they hold. But are you telling me somehow that fallen man trying to deal with a deception that has been allowed to exist and created for the purpose of testing and sifting and the mystery Babylon warned about over and over and affected the whole house of Israel right from starting in the garden, which the apostle Paul took it to. You mean to tell me that we're above this? I think we need to repent. Matthew 15, three, and he answered and said to them, why do you yourselves transgress? We're going to talk about this next week. The commandment of Yah for the sake of your tradition. He wasn't saying that all traditions are bad. He's linking there is an obstinate disobedience, as Paul was identifying in matters of spiritual warfare. That's a conscious choice to go against the truth of Yah for the sake of your tradition. Are both sides of this river guilty? You better believe it. We have got some serious influences going on that are creating traditions that are an absolute transgression and rebellion against his truth. All in the name of Yah and Yeshua. Now, I know that's not any of you. That's them. Whoever them is. All right? But we've got to find them so we can all get off the hook today. Can we find them? <laughs> Let's jump on the internet and find a bunch of them so we can feel good about ourselves. The art of deception, the church. It's now something you go to. So the kahal, the ecclesia. Not something you go to, not something you are. Well, that happened with the house of Israel. Israel became a piece of dirt, not a people. Why are we always turning the living sacrifice into an inanimate thing? Land, buildings. Do you find that interesting? The living sacrifice is being turned into what? Things made of stone, the ground, everything. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Interesting. Starting to make a bit more sense now? All of this stuff is attacking the living sacrifice. Israel is a piece of dirt now, not a people. We have a political thing in the house, not a biblical. Nowhere in scripture is the house of Israel a piece of dirt. There is a land that is set aside, was given to Israel. And if Israel inhabits, then it can be titled Israel, the land of Israel. 
What was it before the land of Israel? The land of Canaan. They go in, they take it, and it became the land of Israel. What identifies the inanimate? The living sacrifice does, not the other way around. This has all been switched in our world. Sin, now all about your bad behavior in the fallen state, isn't it? All your struggles in the flesh so you can live the condemnation hamster wheel. What about our transgression, our willing disobedience against our faith? Is it possible that scripture defines sin differently than what we do? Well, this doesn't get us off the hook with all our bad behavior and our struggle in the flesh, but he knows what we were born into. That's why it's got to die. That doesn't give us an excuse to behave badly and to not care about all the bad things we do in the flesh that hurt ourselves and others. But let's not confuse this with what sin is, according to scripture. Big difference. We're going to talk about this next week in a really interesting way and how particularly John and Paul were dealing with this. It's important for us because we've had some switch and bait on this. Many of you have lived your whole faith life feeling contempt, condemned for how uh, unworthy and how good enough you're not. Because you go for a while not doing too bad and then suddenly you're back in bondage and condemnation. The adversary, Satan. Now we got all these good, you know, good versus evil new age concepts. It's not good versus evil. You're in a fallen state participating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there's an adversary here that is allowed to test us. Yes, we experience spiritual warfare as a result of that. But what is spiritual warfare? But there's no boxing match at the throne. I mean, some people's image of Elohim, they'd honestly think he was sitting there trembling sometimes, going, <gasps> What's Satan doing now? <laughs> you know the word. He's answering to the throne. A vessel allowed to exist for the purpose of fulfilling Yah's plan of redemption. Or we can have Harry Potter again. And Satan and God are having a battle. Who here thinks the created can actually stand up against the creator? I don't care whether you're angelic host or whether we're been inserted in this vault. Who thinks here that there's possibly could ever be a boxing match with the throne? Yet many of you have grew up with religious dogma that has made it just that because we have made him in our own image. Well, do you think Hasatan would want you to also make him in his image? Haven't you learned he's the boogeyman? Satan has horns and fangs and he's red and he holds a pitchfork and the fires of hell and he's torturing people. What I mean, wouldn't he love you to think that this was God against God? And all the various hell doctrines with it. This Elohim that loves you so much is going to torture you for all eternity for being born into an existence you never asked for, had any say in and no control over. But of course, if you fail in this fallen state, which you didn't choose to be born in, he's going to torture you for that. Unless you can pay your penance. Sickening. How this has come across. The old versus the New Testament. Can anybody find in the word where it says old and New Testament? I can show you where we've inserted it in our Bible versions. Can you show me where it is? In the word. Even in the Greek, the best you could come up with. The telos. Renewed. Oh, but it's old versus the new. What happens in Western concept in Greek thinking when you say old and new? What does everybody want? Do you want the old? What do we immediately do in our Western mindset? Oh, I want the, the new. I need to be in the in crowd. I want the newer thing. This is what we do. I'm not criticizing anyone. This is what happens in our thinking. Well, there wouldn't be anything in scripture that warns us that there's going to be something that is actually testing and being adversarial to the believer that might want us to think certain ways, that might indoctrinate us certain ways, that might deceive us certain ways 
There's nowhere in the scripture that warns us about deception. <laughs> well, okay, let's get back to them itis. They're deceived, not me. All right, well, let's get back on that internet and find a bunch of deceived people so we can feel good about ourselves. And then we can sit there and go, oh, those poor deceived people. If they could only be like me, then they'd be fine. The Sabbath day. Does not matter. Really? We'll talk a little bit about that next week as well. Okay. Talmud versus his word. By the way, you're hearing a teaching from me to you today. Other than when I'm reading the word, I'm giving you Talmud. <laughs> okay. You need that. It's a teaching. The issue is, does my Talmud, Talmud align with his word? Now, in Judaism, they'll have their Talmud, the Mishnah, their oral, you know, Torah, as they call it, these sorts of things. But does this align all the arguments and grappling and the opinions and the lofty opinions and the structures put in place? Does it align with actually the Torah? You'll find that much of it really does and can give us great insight, perhaps, from that revelation and those seeking of truth into the Torah. But you also find much doesn't. What about the Christian bookstores? Well, it's Judah that has all the Talmud, right? Has anybody walked into a Christian bookstore and just looked around? We have the nerve to point the finger of Judah? If we were honest, what Michael and I would do is we would go all of branch Talmud, donkey speaks Talmud. And when you read the word, now you take that Talmud and you search a matter out. Is this brother serving Elohim and does it align with his word? That's the challenge here. Or am I elevating my Talmud even above the word so that everyone here can conform? Whoa. Do you know, sometimes I can be offensive to other teachers. <laughs> Imagine that, eh? <laughs> Why? Because they don't want to hear My Talmud is not above his word. The question is, as we look at it, as we go through, as we overcome, as we receive revelation, as we work a matter out, as we do all these things, how are we doing it? I'm hoping my Talmud is lining up a lot more with this truth these days than it did 10 years ago. How about you? How about your Talmud when we're giving our lofty opinions to others? Has anybody's Talmud here changed in the last few years? <laughs> Come on, be honest. Have you learned something? And has that changed the way you present it with another brother? How you live your life? How you go about things? Of course it has. And if it hasn't, I'd be more worried. You see, admitting that place and being in a place is teshuva is the place where we humble ourselves to get beyond our pride. Of course you should have grown in the last year. And if you haven't, you should be terrified because you're still here. And if you're still here, that means you have an Elohim that says we're not done yet. <laughs> the fact you exist should give you the answer that you're not done yet. Oh, but that doesn't include me. It's them. Oh, I'm the teacher of all knowledge and all truth for the body of Messiah. So it doesn't include me. No, it includes all of us. And all of us are required to be in that place of repentance. But we all need help to be in it. Look at this. John 8, 31, 32. Then Yeshua 
to those Jews, Yehuda, which were that believed in him. If you continue in my word, we often leave this bit out, isn't it? Don't we always hear the truth will set you free? I always say to people, just, just read a little bit, <laughs> read the verse before. If you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. What was the word when this was spoken? You do realize what we call a New Testament right now didn't exist. What existed? The Torah and the prophets. Oh, the thing we call the Old Testament. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is the words of our king. If you continue in the Torah and the prophets, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's sobering, isn't it? You know, it's going to make you free because you're going to fail, just like they all had record of failing, but they also had record of overcoming. Do you know that if you continue in the Torah and prophets, you're going to realize how much of a sinner you actually are? We're going to talk about this next week. <laughs> Who here is going to show up for next week? I'm like, you must be really loving this today. It's one of those sifting messages. Look at this. That is sheet 3220. So we'll finish this off. And then he said to him, your name shall no longer be called Yaakov, but Israel. For you have striven with what? Yah and with men and have prevailed. So you have walked this out with both. You have gone through this process. Yaakov, you've prevailed. Not he beat up Yah somehow in the you know, wrestling around the ground. He, he prevailed in what? The journey, the whole house of Israel was going to be born from this prevailing. I'd say that's a pretty serious overcoming. And Yaakov had some serious transgression that he had allowed into his own house. We talk about that in the uh, book of Micah series. Okay. The family parable. So we're going to finish up with this parable here. We want the sex with no accountability spiritually, don't we? We want to engage with this. We want to have our spiritual sex. But we don't want any accountability with it. We want to skip the nine months of pregnancy so we don't have any responsibility for what we did. No discipleship. And then there's a very messy situation coming, the trials and travails of our life. And we're told to overcome, contending with the faith. Do you notice how he gives the description of coming to the end of the age? Birth pains? You know, this is all playing out in the shadow picture that we all have. Well, I don't want to deliver. I don't want to be in the delivery room. <laughs> I don't want to go through that. I, 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 I just came here for the sex. Hmm. Not the pregnancy, not the delivery. Oh, whoa, I want the sex. Oh, but I want the new life. I want the blessings without the consequences. I don't want to take care of the mother and child. No, 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 no. I came here for the sex. Take. Take, take, take. Are we takers? Second Timothy 3, 15, 17, which we've been speaking a little bit on this particular session today. And how from a childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation. Whoa. You mean the Old Testament can help me become wiser in matters of the plan of redemption? Yes, but include the faith in Messiah Yeshua. All scripture, no New Testament here, is breathed out by Yah and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. You mean the thing that is going to play a part in the circumcision of the heart? Yes. And that the man of Yah may be complete and equipped for every good work. I mean, he can use me. The more I grow to the fullness, that submission and the fullness, the fullness of Messiah, just like Paul talked about, the more he uses us. John 4, 23, 24. But the hour comes now and is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
this was a great fulfillment and an event called Shavuot that happened. Literally fulfilled. And we've been walking this out in the last days, the last two days ever since. For the Father seeks such to worship him. Yeah, spirit, and that they may worship him in spirit and in truth. So ask yourself, is conformity a sin? We're going to talk about this next week. How are we to view this now? Because we've been looking at this conformity or unity. Is conformity a sin? Just ask yourself. Let's finish it up here. So again in Timothy, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. There's an appearance of godliness going on. For among them are those who creep into households, capture weak women, or the design, the nurture design that we started with here at the beginning of today, burdened with missing the mark or a miss of hearing. By the way, the whole kahal is considered the feminine in this picture. We got that? We have a gender shadow picture playing now, of course. I'm always trying to even argue that one anymore. They've just gone crazy. But, but in the actual shadow picture, we're all supposed to be in the nurture right now. Interesting. And led astray by various passions. By the way, the nurture protector design is ferocious. So, you know, that's where we get mama bear from. <laughs> all right. The overseeing protector will do things that the nurture design will struggle to do in its form of protection. Always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of truth. Wow. Take, take, take. There's a conformity race going on and I use the tortoise and the hare. Who wins this race in this wonderful little analogy that you should all be familiar with? If you don't know, the tortoise wins. How is that possible? That hare is bouncing around to every possible form of conformity, always learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. You know what the little tortoise did? He just kept going. And that's my encouragement to all of you. Keep going in this conformity race. There is a truth, and the Ruach will lead us unto all truth. Finish the race is what Paul did. Fight the good fight. We're going to finish here. 2 Timothy 4 says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. This is a heart race. It's heart circumcision. This is where we're going with our faith. Or else we're going to be the hare that's bouncing back and forth in every form of religious dogma and conformity. And when one day, suddenly we realize and wake up, I didn't cross the finish line. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Wow, what covered the breastplate? What does the breastplate cover? The heart. The breastplate of righteousness, for which the Messiah, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. He's speaking to direct matters of an overcomer. Not only to me, but also to all of you who have loved his appearing. He came. He did not ask you to endure or do what he was not willing to do himself. And we're the only faith in the world that has that. And now we all long for his appearing once again. And those who do will not discard any of these words. You can discard me. But let's not us discard the word. Okay. Let's finish there. Next week we're going into, remember what you're going to remember here is conformity sin all right let's finish there we'll see you